let's try to get through another chapter of synthetic intelligence and the transmutation of humankind. A Roadmap to the Singularity and Beyond by Wes Penray. We are to chapter 8, Opposition in Academia and Science. And the first section is Voices Against Jade Helm 15. Transhumanists see nature as an obstacle that man must overcome. We could say that transhumanism embraces the physical realm, while those who think along my lines and those of most readers embrace the spiritual realm. According to transhumanism, nature has flaws, but most important, nature is slow to evolve and is the world where everything inevitably dies, contrary to transhumanism, which is the world of eternal life where everything always lives. Does transhumanism remind you of Satanism, but also perhaps of alchemy? Death must be overcome. Death is scary. Death is a mystery. And death is loss of information. The followers of the transhumanist movement do not understand that knowledge is automatically stored in the mass consciousness and the so-called Akashic Records. The overlords know this, of course, but they need to keep letting death be a mystery to people, something to fear. Transhumanism is based on fear of death, and this fear button is what they push to recruit their followers. Thus, the controllers will never tell the masses about the afterlife. We are given hints about it, but by the same token, we are also given hints that there is no afterlife. The controllers need to keep the <clears throat> yin and yang concept going in order to divide and conquer. Apparently, <clears throat> there are certain people in academia and in science who have begun to oppose the AI agenda. They can see the ultimate danger with transhumanism and AI. About the time the infamous Jade Helm 15 happened, more about that later, thousands of scientists protested against transhumanism and artificial intelligence. Two of the most famous sci scientists were Stephen Hawking and Noam Chomsky. They signed an open letter calling for a ban on killer robots. The scientists who protested were of the opinion that if we, if we let the AI movement continue the way it was, the robots will eventually take over and eradicate mankind. They said it's more or less inevitable because of the superior intelligence robots will have. Robots will consider humans obsolete and terminate us. These scientists appeared extremely worried. Some say these scientists are only playing a part of the AI game to present the opposite side of the movement to again yin and yang in balance. This I believe is probably true to a large extent. Perhaps Hawking is on the right track now partly realizing what is actually going on behind the scenes, or he is just playing his role in the agenda. Professor Hawking and a number of other protesting scientists and academia have been part of creating this future nightmare, and at one point, perhaps, they realized that what they have been involved in is destructive. They became concerned that, if not stopped, the AI movement might lead to the end of humankind. They might have believed that they needed to make up for the damage they unwittingly had done. Hence, they started protesting against the movement. Or again, it's all just make-believe. Stephen Hawking sits on the board of directors of the Future of Life Institute, a group consisting of some of the greatest minds of our time, whose aim is to mitigate, quote, ex existential risk facing humanity, unquote. They now warn us of the danger of starting a military AI arms race. Other members of the board are Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak, Apple's co-founder. There was recently a TV series called The Colony, which is about a totalitarian society where humans are fenced into colonies with huge brick walls surrounding each colony. A malevolent alien race had fairly recently landed and segregated humans by creating these colonies, and depending on where you were located at the moment the aliens took over, that's where you got stuck from there on. This meant that you could get separated from friends and family who might have been designated to live in another colony, 
without any communication between the colonies. No one was allowed outside the walls, fences, or they would be killed or sent to some mysterious place called the factory. The aliens kept themselves hidden, but were in contact with some key members of mankind, and the aliens had man surveil man in a super direct or super strict military fashion. In fact, they were using drones that flew around everywhere in order to surveil people. They kept close track of everybody and killed them with a deadly beams of light weapon when programmed to do so. The colony was very popular and new episodes are being made as I'm writing this. This series tells us things about our future that the elite wants us to know. The drones are one part of it. With these drones in mind, the media outlet, The Independent, writes the following in regards to the protesting scientists and their concerns. Quote, These robotic weapons may include armed drones that can search for and kill certain people based on their programming. The next step from the current generation of drones, which are flown by humans who are often thousands of miles away from the war zone. The letter says, AI technology has reached a point where the deployment of such systems is practically, if not legally, feasible within years, not decades. It adds that the autonomous weapons have been described as the third revolution in warfare, after gunpowder and nuclear arms. It says that the Institute sees the great potential of AI to benefit humanity in many ways, but believes the development of robotic weapons which it said would prove useful to terrorists, brutal dictators, and those wishing to per perpetrate ethnic cleansing is not. Such weapons do not yet truly exist, but the technology that would allow them to be used is not far away. Opponents, like the signatories to the letter, believe that by eliminating the risk of human deaths, robotic weapons, the technology for which will become cheap and ubiquitous in coming years, would lower the threshold for going to war, potentially making wars more common. Unquote. I believe this to be true, but AI is not only a danger when it comes to warfare, it's a danger to humankind. Barbara Marciniak's Palladians say that we are at the brink of extinction as a human race at this immediate point, and a new cycle will begin in which new type of human a new type of human will emerge from the extinct Homo sapiens sapiens, and this new human will be AI. They say that we, who have the knowledge, need to create new timelines where we don't need to participate in this insanity, and that's our only way out. If we don't, we too will be sucked into this because it's so easily done and so very, very cleverly set up. In 2015, the UK opposed a ban on killer robots at a U UN conference, claiming that it sees no need for such a prohibition because the UK is not producing such weapons. This immediately contradicts what is actually going on in the UK. The UN conference was in 2015, but already in 2014 there were reports about drones filling the British skies in another independent article. Quote, the number of drones operating in British airspace has soared, with defense contractors, surveillance specialists, police forces, and infrastructure firms among more than 300 companies and public bodies with permission to operate the controversial unmanned aircraft. Other organizations able to operate drones in UK airspace include the Defense Science and Technology Laboratory, a research arm of the Ministry of Defense, and Marlboro Communications, which supplies UAVs and other equipment to the British military. The Home Office and DEFRA have used drones, as have 11 other state bodies." Unquote. One of the biggest lies as I see it is that because this is a genetic library, anything goes. Beings from other worlds or dimensions have the right to come here and experiment and we are told that there is nothing that we can do about it, according to the Palladians. Which begs the question, do we even have the right to intervene in our own future? This idea is shoveled into our consciousness by beings with ulterior motives. 
It is true that Earth is a living library, but this living library was nearly completed, perhaps billions of years ago, when the Queen of the Stars and her helper set up their experiment here. This didn't mean that the genetic library couldn't be adjusted, if needed. However, that was only allowed to be done by the ancient races, the Orion Queen and her genetic engineers. Never was there an intention to let a band of outlaws come to Earth, kill and chase away the original creators, and take over the library as they pleased, only to transform an already evolved race into slave labor. Never was it intended for these impostors to create an entirely new species that was inferior to the existing one for the creator's own selfish purposes, thus nullifying the entire purpose of the original living library. Moreover, it was never intended that this conquering gang of criminal star races should set up a frequency band or quarantine around Earth and our solar system in order to decide who were allowed here and who were not. Now again, this is Wes's um, thoughts on it. <clears throat> um, not necessarily mine, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's interesting brain food, I guess. Stephen, Stephen Hawking has said, quote, success in creating AI would be the biggest event in human history. Unfortunately, it might also be the last unless we learn how to avoid the risk, unquote. As one who has contributed to AI and the singularity, is he now getting cold feet, but still wants to hang on to the idea that AI can be beneficial if handled with care? Hawking may be a genius, but he's still a scientist at heart. Also, if someone who does not have a criminal mind realizes that they have participated in something that is very destructive, in order to make themselves feel better, they need to justify his or her wrongdoings unless the person wants to take full responsibility. Responsibility is sometimes very difficult because we need to ransack ourselves, but it's nonetheless necessary for all of us. Hopefully Hawking is on his way, but I'm not so sure. We will just scrutinize Hawking's more in the next section of this chapter. Understanding human behavior means that we can have more compassion for those who try to become better and less naive. All right, on to the next section, other concerned voices from academia. Other, uh, other concerned voices from academia. It is certainly not only Professor Hawking who is speaking out against AI. Virtually everything that has to do with AI is extremely dangerous to our species and it will wipe out humanity as we know it if it is allowed to progress. This is not a science fiction scenario. It is inevitable. We are talking about overlord technology, and all their technology benefits their purposes, not ours. I work with a bunch of uh, mathematicians, philosophers, and computer scientists, and um, we sit around and think uh, about the future of machine intelligence, among other things. Once there is superintelligence, the fate of humanity may depend on what the superintelligence does. Think about it. Machine intelligence is the last invention that humanity will ever need to make. The machines will then be better at inventing than we are, and they'll be doing so on digital timescales. What this means is basically a telescoping of the future. So think of all the crazy technologies that you could have imagined maybe humans could have developed in the fullness of time. So cures for aging, space colonization, self-replicating nanobots, or uploading of minds into computers, all kinds of science fiction stuff that's nevertheless consistent with the laws of physics. All of this, a superintelligence could develop, and possibly quite rapidly. Now, a superintelligence with such technological maturity would be extremely powerful. And at least in some scenarios, it would be able to get what it wants. We would then have a future that would be shaped by the preferences of this AI. Superintelligence is a really strong optimization process. It's extremely good at using available means to achieve a state in which its goal is realized. This means that there is no necessary connection between being highly intelligent in this sense and having an objective that we humans would find worthwhile or meaningful. Suppose we give an AI the goal to make humans smile. 
When the AI is weak, it performs useful or amusing actions that cause its user to smile. When the AI becomes super intelligent, it realizes that there is a more effective way to achieve this goal: take control of the world and, like, stick electrodes into the facial muscles of humans to cause constant beaming grins. Take another example. Let's suppose we give the AI the goal to solve a difficult mathematical problem. When the AI becomes super intelligent, it realizes that the most effective way to get the solution to this problem is by transforming the planet into a giant computer, so as to increase its thinking capacity. And notice that this gives the AI an instrumental reason to do things to us that we might not approve of. Human beings in this model are threats. We could prevent the mathematical problem from being solved. Now, of course, presumably things won't go wrong in these particular ways. Right? These are cartoon examples. But the general point here is important. If you create a really powerful optimization process to maximize for objective X, you better make sure that your definition of X incorporates you everything say, you well, care about. Like, If a computer starts sticking electrodes into people's faces, like we just shut it off. A, this is not necessarily so easy to do if we've grown dependent on the system. Like, where is the off switch to the internet? B, why haven't the chimpanzees flicked the off switch to humanity, or the Neanderthals? Like, they certainly had reasons.、Um, we have an off switch, for example, right here. Uh, the reason is that. We are an intelligent adversary. We can anticipate threats and plan around them, but so could a superintelligent agent, and it would be much better at that than we are. Point is, we should not be confident、um, that we have this under control here, and we could try to make our job a little bit easier by, say, putting the AI in a box, like a secure software environment, a virtual reality simulation from which it cannot escape. But how confident could we be that? The AI couldn't find a bug. Like, given that merely human hackers find bugs all the time, I'd say I'm probably not very confident. All right, so we like disconnect the Ethernet cable to create an air gap. But again, like merely human hackers routinely transgress air gaps using social engineering. Like right now, as I speak, I'm sure there is some employee out there somewhere who is being talked into handing out her account details by somebody claiming to be from the IT department.、Uh, More creative scenarios are also possible. Like if you are the AI, you could imagine like wiggling electrodes around in your internal circuitry to create radio waves that you can use to communicate. Or maybe you could pretend to malfunction, and then when the programmers open you up to see what went wrong with you, they look at the source code. Bam! The manipulation can take place. Or it could maybe output the blueprint to really nifty technology, and when we implement it, it has some surreptitious side effect that the、uh, AI had planned. The point here is that we should not be confident in our ability to keep a superintelligent genie locked up in its bottle forever. Sooner or later, it will out. I believe that the answer here is to figure out how to create superintelligent AI such that even if, when it escapes, it is still safe because it is fundamentally on our side because it shares our values. I see no way around this difficult problem. Now. I'm actually fairly optimistic that this problem can be solved. Like we wouldn't have to try to write down a long list of everything we care about, or, or worse yet, spell it out in some computer language like C++ or Python. Like that, that would be a task beyond hopeless. Instead, we would create an AI that uses its intelligence to learn what we value, and whose motivation system is constructed in such a way. That it is、uh, motivated to pursue our values or to perform actions that it predicts that we would have approved of. We would thus leverage its intelligence as much as possible to solve the problem of value loading. This can happen, and the outcome could be very good for humanity. But it doesn't happen automatically. The initial conditions for the intelligent explosion might need to be set up in just the right way. If we are to have a controlled detonation, the values that the AI has needs to match ours, not just in the familiar context, like where we can easily check how the AI behaves, but also in all novel contexts that the AI might encounter in the indefinite future. And there are also some other esoteric issues that would need to be solved, sorted out, the exact details of its decision theory, how to deal with logical uncertainty, and so forth. So the technical problems. That need to be solved to make this work look quite difficult. Not as difficult as making a superintelligent AI, but fairly difficult. 
Here is the worry: making super intelligent AI is a really hard challenge. Making super intelligent AI that is safe involves some additional challenge on top of that. The risk is that somebody figures out how to crack the first challenge without also having cracked the additional challenge of ensuring perfect safety. So I think that、um, we should work out a solution to the control problem in advance, so that we have it available by the time it is needed. Now it might be that we cannot solve the entire control problem in advance because maybe some elements. Can only be put in place once you know the details of the architecture where it will be implemented. But the more of the control problem that we solve in advance, the better the odds that the transition to the machine intelligence era will go well. This,、um, this to me looks like a thing that is well worth doing. And I mean, I could imagine that if、uh, things turn out okay, that people a million years from now look back at this century, and it might well be that. They say that the one thing we did that really mattered was to get this thing right. Thank you. In 2015, there was a UN meeting attended by anti-singularitists, including MIT physicist Max Tegmark and the founder of Oxford's Future of Humanity Institute, Nick Bostrom. They talked in depth about the possible dangers of artificial superintelligence. They postulated that in the beginning, mankind could benefit from these new technologies, but in the long term, AI would be an uncontrollable machine whose actions cannot be anticipated by anyone on this planet. Although prominent voices are being raised against AI and the singularity, they still have little or no bearing on the final decision. Regarding whether or not the AI projects should continue, the ball is rolling fast, and it can't be stopped unless enough people refuse to cooperate by not buying in, buying any of the smart products on the market, whatever these smart products might be in the near future. In addition, most people on this planet have nanobots in their bloodstream because of chemtrails, vaccines, medications, and other sources, and these can be activated at any time. In order to resist this, we must have the knowledge, inner strength, and high cons consciousness necessary not to let these nanobots activate. It can be done, but it does require a focused person with high integrity and awareness. Another outspoken person about AI is Apple's co-founder Steve Wozniak, who says, "Quote: Computers are going to take over the humans, no question." He told the outlet. Recent technological advancements have convinced him that writer Raymond Kurzweil, who believes machine intelligence will surpass human intelligence within the next few decades, is onto something. Like people, including Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, have predicted, I agree that the future is scary and very bad for people. He said, "If we build these devices to take care of everything for us, eventually they'll think faster than us." And they'll get rid of the slow humans to run companies more efficiently. Will we be the gods? Will we will we, we be the family pets, or will we be ants that get stepped on? I don't know about that. Unquote. It is interesting to note that Apple's virtual assistant for the iPhone, Siri, uses artificial intelligence technology to anticipate users' needs. It seems as if Wozniak is speaking with a forked tongue. Apart from Hawking, Steve Wozniak is another person I would investigate. He is a Freemason, and his wife is a member of the female division of Freemasonry, the Order of the Northern Star. Elon Musk would also be on my radar. Elon Musk, the CEO of Tesla, and as we already know, Bill Gates of Microsoft, have also raised their voices against AI. Although Gates is supposedly still on the fence on this issue. Musk is perhaps the most, or the more, outspoken antagonist against AI, but his motives might be questioned. He has called AI the biggest existential threat to mankind, and it's hard to disagree with that. Although he is an AI antagonist, he is still an investor in DeepMind and Vicarious, two AI ventures. Why? He claims that quote. 
it's not from the standpoint of actually trying to make any investment return. I like to just keep an eye on what's going on. Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition, but you have to be careful. In a Reddit, ask me anything, Bill Gates agrees with Musk. I agree with Elon Musk and some others on this and don't understand why some people are not concerned, he wrote. Unquote. As I've mentioned before, and as Dr. Kurzweil also mentioned in his books and in lectures and interviews, the controllers want to hear both positive and negative voices on AI and the singularity. And even though not many protesting voices are being raised by the public, there are many in academia and in science who vouch against it. Much of it is just a dog and pony show, but it still has some value and people who are interested in finding out more about this can do so, and at least take an individual standpoint. Remember that every individual standpoint on this is very important. The more people who make up their minds, the greater chance we have to stop this on a global scale. Remember, as always, to scrutinize everybody in a higher societal position, even those who seem to be speaking our language. This also includes Professor Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking is perhaps the world's most well-known popular scientist today. Not only is he brilliant, but people also admire him for having accomplished so much despite his severely disabled body. People often read his statements when new t discoveries are made in the field of physics, astrophysics, and astronomy. The question is how interested people are in listening to his warnings when it comes to AI. There are people who might be interested, but I believe very few have a distinct opinion about it because they think they know too little about it. They might have other things to attend to, and they count on the government to take care of it. Believing the government only works in the best interest of the people. Whether or not I am correct about Hawking when I suggest that it is his guilt that is motivating him to come forward in a big way, he has made his position clear on many occasions. In the same article that Wozniak, Musk, and Gates are mentioned above, Hawking is lining up with them. Quote, Physicist Stephen Hawking has warned that AI could eventually take off on its own. It's a scenario that doesn't bode well for our future as a species. Humans who are limited by slow biological evolution couldn't compete and would be superseded, he said. Unquote. It, in an Ask Me Anything session in Reddit, Professor Hawking replied to a question about robots becoming violent toward humans. Quote, the real risk with AI isn't malice, but competence, Professor Hawking said. A superintelligent AI will be extremely good at accomplishing its goals, and if those goals aren't, aren't aligned with ours, we're in trouble. You're prob probably not an evil ant hater who steps on ants out of malice, but if you're in charge of a hydroelectric green energy project and there's an ant hill in the region to be flooded, too bad for the ants. Let's not place humanity in the position of those ants." Unquote. What bothers me with Hawking's comments is that he is for some strange reason not taking the superbrain computer into consideration. It's well known that the superbrain computer is a real project and that the superbrain computer is built to connect humanity to the new virtual reality. Obviously, Professor Hawking must know about this. Moreover, Professor Hawking emphasizes that if the AI becomes more intelligent than humans, they will also be able to enhance their own intelligence as they please, and the difference in intelligence between an AI and a human will be greater than that between an AI or between a human and a snail, Hawking warns us. Hawking still believes that we can create benevolent AI if we are careful with what our goals are. He is afraid of the undirected AI that is under development today, and instead he wants to create beneficial AI only. He wants us to start doing that today rather than tomorrow before it's too late, and computers have become too clever for us humans to handle. What Hawking fails to address that even if we set a goal to create only beneficial AI, 
power-hungry psychopaths could quickly turn it into something much more malevolent, and they wouldn't have any problems infiltrating the entire thing and taking it over. Again, Hawking is a smart guy. He must know Human Power Hunger 101. He may not know the rest of the story about the ET connection, but what he's suggesting is quite naive for someone coming from such an academic background. Instead, it seems as if the famous scientist is playing his role in the agenda, wittingly or unwittingly, by on the one hand warning people of the downsides of AI, and on the other hand promoting that we need to focus on getting into space as fast as science permits. When doing this, he puts people's focus on the idea that we need to colonize space as fast as we can in order to save and expand our species, which is exactly what Dr. Kurzweil promotes, and this is a key aspect of the Alien Invader Forces agenda. Okay, that's the end of this chapter, and um, so I don't know what, what else to say about it. Um, we'll pick up next time. We'll be in Chapter 9, Humanity's War on Humanity, and we'll pick up there next time, so talk to you then.